here. My name is Catherine Figueroa. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm 16 year, years old and I'm a daughter to immigrants who came to this country for a better future. My parents were arrested by Sheriff Arpaio when I was nine years old. They were working. I didn't know working was a crime. But like I said, I was just nine, so I didn't understand really what was going on. I fell into a deep depression because of Arpaio. Arpaio took away my childhood because I had to grow up from one day to another. I am one of millions of other kids that are left behind. A lot of kids come home to the news that their parents have been detained or deported. In my case, I saw how my dad was being arrested on TV. Those images come back to me every day. I want all deportations to stop. That's why we need Bernie Sanders to be our president. He will make a change in my, in my future, in our future. Vote for a political revolution that cares about our communities and doesn't destroy our country.
So please tell your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers, everyone to vote for Bernie Sanders. I want to welcome you, our future President of the United States. Let me begin by thanking uh, Derek Watchman, uh, and let me thank Russell Begay, the President of the Navajo Nation. Russell, thank you. Let me thank, I hope I don't mispronounce his name, Kevin Todacini. And mostly, let me thank, let me thank Catherine Bueno for being here today. A young, a, young woman, a young woman of extraordinary intelligence and extraordinary courage, who has used the tragedy of her own family and the deportation of her parents, who she saw being arrested on TV. She has used that grief and that anger to stand up and fight for justice and I cannot thank her more for what she has done. And we're going to talk about immigration reform in a moment. But maybe I just begin by saying to your sheriff here, Mr. Apayo, why don't you pick on people who have the power to fight back? Stop picking on children like Catherine and others. And let me begin by saying, as I have said before, that if elected president, we are going to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. Whether Mr. Apayo likes it or not, And if the Congress does do, not, doesn't do what it's supposed to do, we will use the executive powers of the presidency to the full extent possible. It is not acceptable to me and a vast majority of the people in our country that 11 million undocumented folks are living in the shadows, they are living in fear, they are being exploited, and that has got to end. I know a little bit about the immigration experience. My dad was an immigrant, came from Poland, and all of us have got to do everything that we can to make sure that people in this country are not living in fear. I want to um, thank all of you for being here, and I want to apologize for the several thousand people who could not get into this room, um, who are outside. I hope they stay outside. Uh, I just had the opportunity to say a few words to them, but um, we should have had a larger venue, and I'm sorry that we didn't. Uh, but again, thank you for the many thousands of people who are here with us this evening. Um, just a word about this campaign and what we are trying to do. When we began this campaign, we were at 3% in the polls, about 70 points behind Secretary Clinton. 
Uh, we had no political organization. Uh, we had no money. We had no name recognition. Other than that, we were doing really great. <laughs> but we have come a very long way in 10 months. And we think, we think that now that we are in the West, maybe the most progressive where we're going to have elections not only here but in uh, Utah and Idaho and we're heading further in a couple of uh, months to California and to Washington State and to Oregon. Uh, we think that the climate is a little bit friendlier for us. We think we've got a path toward victory. And if we can bring out large turnouts, we're going to win this thing. I'm proud that up to now we have won nine states. We have almost 850 delegates. And with your help on Tuesday, we're going to win here in Arizona. Now, what the reason that we are doing as well as we are is we're doing something very radical in American politics. We are telling the truth. And as all of you know, the truth is not, only, it's not always pleasant. But we cannot go forward as a nation if we continue to push underneath the carpet the most important crises that we have to address. The way we go forward is bring these issues up, address them, and go forward no more hiding them. Issue number one, and that is this campaign is addressing the crisis of American democracy. The fact, the fact that we have a campaign finance system which is corrupt and which is undermining American democracy. Look, democracy is not complicated. Don't let anybody suggest to you that it is. What democracy means is one person, one vote. You want to vote for me? Thank you. You want to vote against me? That's okay. That's democracy. But what I do not want to see, and we will end, is billionaires and Wall Street buying elections. Now, what makes our campaign quite unique in American history is that up to this point in the election, we have received over 5 million individual campaign contributions. That is more individual campaign contributions than any candidate in the history of the United States of America at this point. Anybody here know what the average contribution is? Now, I want you all to know that just that reality, 5 million contributions averaging $27, that is revolutionary. And what that shows is you can run a winning national campaign and not be dependent on Wall Street or billionaires. <laughs> Unlike my Democratic opponent, and I think every Republican, we do not have a super PAC. We don't want a super PAC. 
Unlike my opponent, we are not raising millions of dollars from Wall Street or the fossil fuel industry or the drug companies. And by the way, I've not given too many speeches on Wall Street for $225,000 a speech. But it is not only a corrupt campaign finance system that is undermining American democracy. You got governors all over this country who are suppressing the vote, who are trying. Look, we have got one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country on earth. What any sensible person would say is, how do we increase voter turnout? How do we make it easier for people to participate in the political process? But what we have in this country is a number of cowardly Republican governors who are, who are afraid of free and fair elections. Who want to make it harder for poor people, for people of color, for old people, for young people to participate in the democratic process. I say, I say to those governors and members of the legislature, if you don't have the guts to participate in a free and fair election, get another job, get out of politics. If elected president, we are going to take those governors on. In my view, if you're 18 years of age, a citizen of this country, you have the right to vote. End of discussion. And this campaign is talking not only about ending a corrupt campaign finance system, but we're also going to address the crisis of a rigged economy. Now, the corporate media doesn't talk about it too much, so I'll talk about it. This is what is going on economically in America today. Today in America, we have more income and wealth inequality than almost any other major country on Earth. It is worse here today than at any time since 1928. Listen to this. Listen to this. In America today, the top one-tenth of one percent now owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. That is called a rigged economy. In America today, 20 wealthiest people, 20 people, own more wealth than the bottom half of America, 150 million people. <coughs> that is a rigged economy. Let me give you another example of what a rigged economy means. The wealthy, wealthiest family in America today is who? Good, smart group, all right is the Walton family that owns Walmart. I don't know what they're worth. I think something around $60 billion. They're doing okay. <laughs> don't worry about them. They'll get by. Now, this is what a rigged economy is about. The Waltons who own Walmart pay their workers wages that are so low, and they're the largest private sector employer, that many of their workers are forced to go on Medicaid, food stamps, and subsidized housing. You got that? Wealthiest family pays workers' wages so low. Who do you think is subsidizing the Walton family by paying taxes to make sure that people get Medicaid and food? You are. A rigged economy is when working families have to subsidize the wages of the wealthiest family in America. That is absurd. So I say, 
I say to the Walton family, get off of welfare, pay your workers a living wage. And while we have a massive level of income and wealth inequality, the situation is worse for many of our minorities. In fact, uh, Latino families uh, during the Wall Street, as a result of the Wall Street meltdown, lost two-thirds of their wealth. Latino families lost two-thirds of their wealth mostly in housing. African Americans lost half of their wealth as a result of the Wall Street economic downturn. Now, it is not just wealth, it is income. They are going to get to them in one minute. Give me one minute on that one. In terms of income, what's going on in America? What's going on is that many of you are working longer hours for lower wages. Many of you are working two or three jobs trying to cobble together some income and some health care. Am I right? Okay. So what you got in America today, in my state of Vermont, here in Arizona, all over this country, you got people working longer and longer hours. You got mom working. You got dad working, you got the kids working. What does this do? What does this do to families? It stresses out marriages, correct? Parents don't have enough time to spend with their children, and that causes other problems. So here is a, in the midst of all that, people working incredible hours, 58% of all new income created today is going to the top 1%. You got that? People working longer and lower hours, but the top 1% gets 58% of the income. Are you guys ready for a radical idea? Yeah. Together, we're going to going to create an economy that works for all of us, not just the 1%. Yeah. And let me tell you another truth that we don't talk about very often, and that is we have a criminal justice system that is broken. What this campaign is about is asking the American people to think outside of the box, outside of the status quo. Do not accept the reality that is out there just because it is out there. All right. It is not normal, it is not natural that we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality. That was created. In terms of criminal justice, it is not acceptable that we have more people in jail than any other country on earth. China is a country four times our size. We have more people in jail than China. And those people in jail are disproportionately African-American, Latino, and Native American. So you know what we're going to do? What we are going to do is something just ever so radical. Instead of locking up our kids, we're going to invest in education and jobs. Right now, Right now, unemployment for young people in the Native American community, sky high. Latino community, sky high. African American community, sky high. I want those kids in school or in jobs, not in jail. This campaign is talking to ordinary Americans rather than just wealthy campaign contributors. And what workers are telling me is they cannot get by on eight or nine bucks an hour. 
Now, I understand somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the governor here is trying to make it impossible for cities to raise the minimum wage. Is that right? Well, this governor is doing exactly the opposite of what should be happening. When somebody works 40 hours a week, that person should not be living in poverty. So I say to this governor, got some bad news for you. We're going to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour all over this country. And I know, I know that every man in this room will stand with the women in the fight for pay equity. There is no rational economic reason why women are making 79 cents on the dollar. That is old-fashioned sexism, and together we're going to change that. This campaign is listening to senior citizens. Now, this is something media completely ignores. But the reality is that we have millions of seniors in this country who are trying to get by on eleven, twelve thousand dollars a year Social Security. And you know what? Nobody gets by on eleven, twelve thousand dollars a year Social Security. And then in the midst of that, you got Republicans in the Senate and the House. What they want to do is cut Social Security benefits. Well, I got. Well, I got some bad news for them as well. We're not going to cut Social Security benefits. We're going to raise Social Security benefits. And this campaign has some... We have talked to young people all over the country. And we have listened to young people. And you know what young people are telling me? What they are saying is, why does it happen? Why does it happen that I end up thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt because I got the education that I need? Anybody here with student debt? All right. Again, what I beg of you, think outside of the box. Just think for a moment. We tell all of the young people how important education is, right? We know, all of us, that we live in a competitive global economy. We've got to have the best educated workforce in the world, right? Why then do we punish millions of people for doing what they are supposed to do, which is get a good education. Now, public education today means, and it has meant for 100 years, that public schools are available to all from first grade to 12th grade, free public education, and that's great. But all of you know the world has changed the economy has changed. People today need more education to get the good jobs that are out there. Is that right? All right. And the truth is, truth is that a college degree today in many ways is equivalent to what a high school degree was 50 years ago. And that is why I believe that when we talk about public education today, we have got to talk about making public colleges and universities tuition free. Is this a radical idea? No. This is not a radical idea. This is a much less radical idea than people who 100 years ago said 
that all the young people should get first grade through 12th grade. That was pretty radical. To extend that to public colleges and universities when other countries are doing it, when, shock of all shocks, 50 years ago in America, the great public colleges and universities were virtually tuition free. And furthermore, what we have got to do is to significantly lower interest rates for those who now have student debt. Too many people out there are stuck with interest rates, six, seven, eight percent. They should be able to refinance at the lowest interest rates they can find, substantially lowering student debt in America. Now let me say a word about Native American communities. Let us, I think there is no debate, sadly no debate, that from day one, from the first day that settlers came to this country, the Native American people have been lied to, they have been cheated, and negotiated treaties have been broken. We owe, we owe the Native American people so, so much. And we are, we are forever grateful that they have shared their culture, that they have shared their respect for the environment with us. But all of us know that the first Americans, our Native American brothers and sisters today, live in many cases on ancestral lands which they have called home for thousands of years. Others live on lands where they have been moved forcibly, by federal policies throughout our history. But all too often, Native Americans have not been heard on issues that impact their communities. They have been told what to do. They have not been involved in the process. Despite the existence of negotiated treaties which coerce tribal nations into ceding, as we all know, millions of acres of their homelands to the United States in exchange for guaranteed rights, many of those rights have not been upheld. Despite past and ongoing mistreatment of Native Americans, including federally sanctioned assimilation through boarding schools, Native Americans have maintained possession of cultural and natural resources today that, <coughs> that are the key to the Indian country's bright future. The United States government has a duty to ensure equal opportunities and justice for all of its citizens, including our first Americans. And let us, let us be honest, again, let us be honest and acknowledge that we are not doing that today. The challenges, and I have been all over the country, speaking to tribal leaders, not just here in Arizona. And this is what I have learned. Native Americans continue to face appalling levels of inequality and systematic injustice. Today in America, one in four Native Americans are living in poverty. And the high school graduation rate is 67%, the 
the lowest of any racial demographic group. The second leading cause of death for Native Americans between 15 and 24 is suicide. And that speaks to incredible despair. Second leading cause of death for young people is suicide. One in three, it's important that we lay this out because without the knowledge, we cannot go forward. One in three, one in three Native American women will be raped in her lifetime. Most of the offenders are non-Native. Most of the programs dedicated to the tribal nations are underfunded. That has led to inadequate housing, inadequate health care, inadequate education, and insufficient law enforcement. Today, Native Americans have a lower life expectancy and higher rates of uninsured than the population at large, and even those who have health coverage have difficulty accessing the health care that they need. Exacerbating the struggles of Indian country is a failure to understand and support the principles of self-determination. During my time in Congress, I have worked with other members and with the Native American communities to address the challenges facing the Native community and to create opportunities for those communities. I have recently introduced in the U.S. Senate the Save Oak Flat Act. This is, this, is, this is the same legislation that Representative Raul Grijalva has introduced in the House. Raul, I believe, would have been here with us tonight, but the Congress is in session. And that legislation would repeal a federal lands transfer of a sacred place in Arizona given to a foreign mining corporation. The sacred places of our Native American communities cannot and must not be sacrificed for the profits of mining interests. <laughs> As a senator, I have consistently opposed tar sands and fracked gas pipelines. like the Keystone Pipelines and other pipelines throughout this country. In my view, not only are these pipelines themselves causing environmental damage, not only do they stand the possibility of terrible oil spills, but ultimately, as a nation, we have got to break our dependence on fossil fuel. And move aggressively to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And you are living here in this beautiful state. You have an unbelievable natural resource. It is called the sun. Sun doesn't have oil spills. Sun doesn't have gas leaks. Sun, especially in your state, is out almost every day. Wish I could say that about my state. But you have an opportunity here to stand up to the fossil fuel industry and transform your energy to solar, to wind, to geothermal.
As a nation, as a nation, we need to increase tribal sovereignty <coughs> and tribal jurisdiction in prosecuting criminal acts done on tribal lands rega regardless of the race of the perpetrator. Tribes need increased control over tribal housing programs, and we need a major investment in Native American housing. And by the way, City of Washington has a very good football team, but it doesn't have to be called the Redskins. We need to recommit the federal government to honor the treaties and statutes that are at the core of the trust relationship. And that means having senior level tribal appointees with access to all executive agency leadership. Washington should never act on issues of importance to the tribes without being in consultation with them. Finally, the federal government must protect Native American cultures. Tribal communities must be empowered by providing resources to protect and revitalize indigenous languages religions, cultures, and tradition. The culture of the Native American people is so rich, is so extraordinary, that all of us will gain by preserving and enhancing that culture. Now, when we talk about the problems facing our country, and when we talk about thinking big, we have got to ask ourselves why it is that in America we are the only country, only major country, that does not guarantee health care to all people. We're the only ones. Now, the Affordable Care Act has done some good things. I'm on the committee that helped write it. And I appreciate President Obama's efforts in pushing that legislation through. But we still have 29 million people without any health insurance. And in the Native American communities, clearly health care is inadequate in many respects. We have many people, including you, some of you, who are underinsured with large deductibles and copayments, right? Yeah. What, kind of, what kind of deductibles do we have here? 4,000? How much? $2,500. 13,000. For a large family? 13,000. All right, what does this mean? In other words, people tell you, well, we got 90% of the people insured. Yeah, that's true, but you got a $13,000 deductible. That means if you don't have any money in your pocket, you're not going to go to the doctor when you should. Is that right? And you know what? We lose thousands of people a year because they don't go to the doctor when they should. They die. Furthermore, today in America, we got a pharmaceutical industry that is ripping off the American people unbelievably. Our people, you, me, all of us are paying by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, 29 million people uninsured, more underinsured, and yet we end up spending far more per person on health care than do the people of other countries. So let me say this so there is no ambiguity. I believe that health care is a right of all people, not a privilege.
And that is why I believe that this country must move toward a Medicare for all health care system. That's right. And that's why in Vermont I am really proud that we are the first state in the country to mandate GMO labeling. Let me say a word to our Latino brothers and sisters. You heard from a young lady before who told you a story that a young girl should not have to tell you. Seeing on television her parents arrested because they were at work. Let me be as clear as I can be. I believe that it is absolutely imperative that we take 11 million people out of the shadows, out of living in fear. And I believe, as I mentioned before, that Congress must pass comprehensive immigration reform. Right now, people are being exploited ruthlessly. That has got to stop. And let me repeat. If Congress does not do its job, I will use the executive powers of the presidency to expand what President Obama has started. And furthermore, we will put an end to what Catherine's family has experienced. We will stop the deportations of people. <laughs> Furthermore, when we talk about immigration and when we talk about criminal justice, I have introduced legislation to ban private prisons and private <laughs> detention facilities. Corporations should not be profiting off the misery and the detention of people in this country. Also want to raise an issue that is close to home here in Arizona, and that is the outrageous and unconscionable behavior of Sheriff Joe Arpillo. You know, some of you may have known that just the other day my wife Jane, and you just met Jane, went to visit families in that so-called tent city. And, that's right. And while she was there to kind of look at the conditions that existed, while she was there to talk to some of the families who were impacted, uh, she was uh, met by uh, the sheriff who kind of ambushed her. But my wife is a tough lady, and she doesn't take ambushes easy. So what she did in that brief meeting that he forced upon her, which he probably regrets now, is he asked, she asked him about racial profiling. And he didn't have an answer. She asked him about the conditions in Tent City and the other abuses that he has perpetuated, and he didn't have an answer. And you know what? He cannot have an answer because what he is doing is un American and uncivilized. As I said before, it is easy for bullies like Sheriff Arpaio to pick on people who have no power. If I'm elected president, the president of the United States does have the power. Watch out, Joe.
This type of outrageous behavior must not continue to exist in this great country. Now, we are, you know, in the course of an election, a lot of people say a lot of things. And one of the arguments made against me is that we cannot win a general election against the Republican. Well, that's one way of putting it, I agree. So here are the facts. The facts are that virtually, not all, but almost every national poll that uh, has Bernie Sanders running against Donald Trump has us winning, has us winning by a lot. The last NBC Wall Street Journal poll had us beating Mr. Trump by 19 points. And in almost every instance, we beat Trump by larger margins than does Secretary Clinton. Now, Mr. Trump will not become President of the United States. Because the American people understand that you cannot have a president who insults Mexicans and Lat Latin Americans. To call the Mexican people rapists and drug dealers and criminals is an outrage. To insult Muslims, one of the largest religions in the world, is unacceptable. To insult women, the American people are not going to vote for a man who insults women, who insults African Americans. All of you must remember, don't forget, that a few years ago, Trump was the head, or at least one of the active people, in the so-called Bertha movement. What that movement was about, understand what it was about. It was an effort to delegitimize the President of the United States. In other words, it wasn't an effort to say we disagree with Obama. It was an effort to say he should not be President of the United States. That was an awful, horrific thing to attempt to do. And I have found it very interesting. President Obama's father was born in Kenya. My father was born in Poland. Now, guess what? Nobody has asked for my birth certificate. Do you think it has something to do with the fact that my skin color is different than the president's? I do. Now, Ultimately, the American people will not elect Donald Trump president because they all understand, we all understand, that the history of this country, the best part of this country, is bringing people together. Black and white, Latino, Native Americans, Asian Americans, that is what makes us an extraordinary country. We learn from each other. We grow from each other. Straight and gay men and women, people born in America, people who have come to America, everybody understands that we are stronger when we stand together, and that trumps every day, dividing us up as Trump would have us be.
And the reason, another reason that Donald Trump will never be elected president is the American people understand something very profound. And that is that community understanding that I have got to help you, you've got to help my children, my children have got to help your children, that we are in this together. And that coming together, supporting each other, will always trump selfishness. <laughs> and what the American people also understand is what every culture, every religion has always taught us. And that is that at the end of the day, love Trump's hatred. Now, everybody, everybody who understands history understands that real and profound change never takes place from the top on down. It is always from the bottom on up. That is the history of the trade union movement, workers standing together to fight for decent wages, decent working conditions. That is the history of the civil rights movement, blacks and whites fighting together to end racism and segregation and bigotry in America. That is the history of the women's movement. Everybody knows, everybody knows that a hundred years ago, not a long time from an historical perspective, women in America did not even have the right to vote. They couldn't get the education they wanted. They couldn't do the jobs they wanted. But women stood up and with their male allies, said that in America, women will not be second-class citizens. And that is the history of the gay rights movement in this country. If we were in this room, Ten years ago, when somebody stood up and said, you know, Bernie, I think that we're going to have gay marriage in all states in this country, the person next to him would have said, what are you smoking? Which actually raises another important discussion. But what happened? What happened is that the gay community and their straight allies facing incredible hatred. They stood up and they said that in America, people have the right to love whoever they want, and that has succeeded. And just in passing, let me say this. Let me get back to criminal justice and mention something to you that I should have mentioned before. One of the things that I have learned is that over the last 30 years, millions of people in this country have gotten police records for possession of marijuana. And a lot of lives have been ruined as a result. Now, right now, under the Federal Controlled Substance Act, marijuana is listed as a Schedule I drug. That's the top of the list alongside heroin. Now, everybody here knows that heroin is a killer drug. And we got an epidemic in my state, throughout New England, and throughout this country. Marijuana is not heroin. And that is why I have introduced legislation to take marijuana out of the Federal Controlled Substance Act.
But here we are in 2016, and it seems to me to be incumbent upon all of us to look around as people have throughout history and ask whether the status quo, what we are seeing around us, is acceptable. I think the answer is no. It is not acceptable that we have seen a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires while we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any nation on earth. It is not acceptable that the middle class is disappearing while almost all new income and wealth goes to the top 1%. It's not acceptable that we are the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care and paid family and medical leave. What our job now, and this is what next Tuesday is about, is to stand up and say loudly and clearly, enough is enough. We need to create a government that works for all of us, not just a handful of billionaires. We will win here in Arizona next Tuesday. If there is a large voter turnout, come on out, bring your friends and relatives. Thank you.